record. Uh, all right. And uh, share my screen. Give me a moment. And we'll go ahead and get started for what I think is going to be a, a, a fun conversation. So, all right. So you should be able to see my slideshow. Kimberly, Chris, Elizabeth, can we see it? Excellent. Thank yeah. you. So uh, the title of this webinar is actually from uh, Congressman Ross's uh, uh, book, uh, recently published book, Be the Leaders You Want to See. There's a line in that that really stuck with me, right? He talks a lot in his book, and he'll talk a little bit about it today, about the importance of really modeling and becoming the leaders that, that we really want to see in uh, civic life. So looking forward to a Civic Learning Week conversation with uh, the Honorable Dennis Ross. So a bit of housekeeping. Um, please be sure to introduce yourself in the chat, however you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat, so please feel free to ask any questions you might have. Uh, and please be sure to silent your microphones. Um, and if you want a copy of Congressman Ross's book, please feel free to email me uh, and with obviously information and we will send you a copy uh, of his book. Um, so about Civic Learning Week, uh, you can visit and learn more about Civic Learning Week at civiclearningweek.org. Um, Civic Learning Week is a new event. It's, uh, I think it's really the second or maybe third year of this event, hosted annually by our friends at iCivics, which is really the, the uh, really 5,000 pound gorilla in the civic learning space um, and seeks to highlight the importance of civic education in sustaining and strengthening constitutional democracy in the United States. And I think it's an important caveat. Remember that we are not a pure democracy, we're a constitutional democracy. I'm glad that they have that in there. By highlighting the civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions that provide the foundation for an informed and engaged populace, CLW seeks to further energize the movement to prioritize civic education across the nation. This is the first time the Institute's actually trying to do an event for uh, Civics Learning Week. And so we're grateful for those of you who are able to uh, attend. We're looking forward to doing more uh, moving forward. Uh, we actually had planned on doing a, an essay project with uh, scholarships and rewards, but uh, fortunately, uh, apparently there are restrictions of what you can pay kids. So uh, go figure. Um, but we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll move forward, but we're very excited to be here with Congressman Ross this evening. So if you're not familiar with the work of the Institute and the Florida Joint Center for Citizenship, and I am very glad to see that my predecessor, Dr. Doug Dobson, uh, is on here, who built up the Institute really from the ground up, and we're very grateful for that, as well as one of our board members, Chuck Kowaleski, uh, who is here as well uh, to support um, the work of the Institute. But the Institute really has four priorities civic education programs that encourage thoughtful debate and discussion about current policy issues, experiential learning programs, which yes, are still possible in Florida, that encourage the development of civic and political skills. Um, and really, this is our, our core function, working to help strengthen the civic education capacity of Florida's edu uh, K-12 education system. And then when we do have a budget that allows it, research, policy analysis, and advocacy. And we even advocate even without that particular budget. Um, so let's just do some quick introductions. You have myself. Uh, uh, I am Steve Maceda. I am the director of the Lou Fry Institute uh, and the Florida Joint, Center for, it's Florida Joint Center for Citizenship. And I am joined by uh, three wonderful colleagues. Uh, go ahead, Chris, introduce yourself. Thanks, Steve. My name is Chris Pinelli, and I'm the director of curriculum at the Institute. Uh, and we're elated to have uh, everybody here. Thank you. Kimberly? Hi, I'm Kimberly Garten. I am a curriculum specialist here at the Institute and also thrilled to be part of this Civic Learning Week event. And Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth Wood, another curriculum specialist with the Institute, and I'm so excited to be on this call with you guys. And for those of you who are familiar with the work of the Institute, those three folks right there do the core amount of the work. Uh, they are the reason we have a comprehensive K-12 curriculum, and we are incredibly grateful for the work that they've done on that. I encourage you to check it out at FordaCitizen.org. Um, and again, you can find us in a couple of different locations there. Please encourage you to do check out our, our websites uh, and, and resources and social media. Um, but let me go ahead and introduce Congressman Dennis Ross. Uh, Congressman Ross is uh, the director of the Center for Public Leadership, uh, American, excuse me, American Center for Public Leadership at Southeastern University and a distinguished professor in the political science program at Southeastern University. He served as a Florida state representative from 2000 to 2008. In 2010, he was elected to the United States Congress, where he served four terms until retiring in January of 2019. During his time in Congress, uh, Congressman Ross served as senior uh, majority whip, 
and also served on the Financial Services Committee, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, the Judiciary Committee, as well as the Education and Workforce Committee. And I am uh, also uh, hopefully not um, out of place to say I consider him a friend um, because uh, he, I have learned a lot from him about really many different things relating to how way politics works, how civics works, and he's uh, helped out, I'll just admit, helped me restore some faith in politics and politicians uh, when it comes to uh, thinking about civics and civic life. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, but today's conversation is going to look at really uh, three or four, five, excuse me, four or five different areas. Civil discourse and why it matters. How have civic relations and conversations changed over time? How do we restore the importance of civil discourse? Why does student civic engagement matter? And how can we encourage young people to get involved? So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm just gonna turn it over to Congressman Ross and just start with that first question. Congressman Ross, when you hear that term civil discourse, based on your experiences and you know, both uh, as a politician and as a citizen, what really comes to mind? You know, first of all, Steve, thank you. And thank you all for participating in this. This is a tremendous honor. It's one of the reasons that uh, uh, I'd left Congress was because of civil discourse was was such a lacking element in, in order to reach consensus on, on issues. Uh, civil discourse to me is not so much being able to seek or find resolution of an issue as it is in building a relationship, finding out what's important to the other person so that they will find out what's important to, 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 to you. Um, it, it's amazing to me that we have thousands of issues in the political process. You know, I saw in the Florida legislature where they had over, I want to say over 2,000 bills filed in a 60-day session, and they passed 325 of them. You know, that's 2,000 issues that you can't be either yes or no on and expect everybody to be the same way. You've got to understand if they do, if somebody's not with you on one issue, they may be with you on the next issue. And that's why the civil discourse is so important, because if you develop the relationship, if you have an empathetic understanding of why somebody is passionate about their issue, you may not agree with them, but there will come a time where you will agree on another issue. And if you don't practice the civil discourse, we find ourselves becoming very more departmentalized and not wanting to reach out to, to somebody else because of the diversity of thought that they have, and it's adverse to mine. So uh, unfortunately, Steve, and this is where I, I laud you all at the, at the Lou Fry Institute, is that part of your curriculum is in, uh, teaching how to develop civil discourse. It is an acquired process. Uh, it, it, it takes time. It takes discipline. And being able to have that respectful conversation, again, you don't have to reach consensus. The focus is to develop the relationship so that at times when you know you can reach consensus, you will, and you can move on to the next issue. I really appreciate how you sort of explored really what that actually means. You talked a lot about the idea of consensus. For you, certainly, uh, you know, you are on uh, the conservative side of the aisle, Republican side of the aisle, but certainly you had relationships <laughs> with uh, both folks in your own party and folks across the aisle. We, we've talked about some of that. And that idea of consensus. Can you give us some examples or ways you really tried to approach that uh, idea of consensus in civil discourse? Absolutely. And it was interesting. When I was in D.C. last week, I visited with one of my former colleagues and a dear friend, Assistant Secretary of Education, Gwen Graham. Gwen, of course, uh, whose father was governor and senator, U.S. senator from Florida, and Gwen served in Congress with me. Gwen and I became good friends, even though we were opposite uh, uh, political parties. But she talked about this last week uh, to my students, and, and, and I've always said it, is that whenever we filed a bill, we would want a co-sponsor from the other party. Why? Because we believed it was necessary. It's part of building uh, consent. If you, if, I remember having a chairman tell me one time after the 2016 election, not to co-sponsor a bill with a Democrat because there was nothing more irrelevant in Congress than a Democrat. And two years later, there was nothing more irrelevant in Congress than a Republican. If you can't seek some type of consensus uh, because you know the winds of the political world will change, you again, it goes back to the relationship. I, I always enjoyed uh, getting to know why people think the way they do. Uh, and, 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 and in doing so, we find some common ground. That common ground is foundational to building consensus. And, and again, we don't always see consensus, uh, but we, we should be seeking it out. You know, compromise is what built this nation. It was at the Constitutional Convention with the Great Compromise that we saw, you know, a very volatile uh, group of, of, of congressmen or, or 
delegates come together to, to, to seek resolution in the developing our constitution. We shouldn't be afraid of it. In fact, we should be focusing it as a, one of our primary purposes in order to achieve a more perfect union. And you talked about that idea of foundational. I appreciate you really talked about that. One of the things that we really emphasize in civics is the foundational nature of the United States, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness within our founding documents. The founding principles as contained in our Declaration of Independence, uh, in our Constitution, and, and other founding documents. And one of the things that I think we stress a lot, which is, I think, sometimes lost, is that those are, in many ways, all compromised documents, Right. Uh, that we know. Uh, and, you know, one of my favorite musicals is 1776. And there's a yeah. classic debate between the South Carolina representative and obviously uh, my favorite John Adams about, yeah. you know, slavery uh, in, in, in the Declaration. I, I think that that stands out as well within that particular framework, as you as you describe it. Well, think about this. In the 90s, when Bill Clinton was president and we had a Republican Congress, welfare reform was vetoed twice. And it took almost three years to get done, but it was it was agreed upon that we needed to get something done in welfare reform. And so it, it took you know it took consensus building. And again, Clinton vetoed it a couple of times, but eventually we got together as a Congress and and a president and had one of the most sweeping reforms in welfare reform that saw benefits we've never seen before: child care, rehabilitation, education, things that help people. You know move off of welfare, but it was a consensus building process that took probably three years to do. And that's the process. That's that's the distillation of thought that has to go into getting good policy. And, you know, that's why we have a deliberative, you know, gridlock process is it takes time, but always seeking to find consensus. You talked a lot about your experiences uh, in Congress and the idea of, you know, reaching consensus and then the work you've done in, in trying to do that. Uh, based on what you've seen in your experience, um, how has really civil discourse and this effort to pursue consensus really changed over the past two decades? It's eroded, Steve. It's it's and it's one of the reasons. And I talk about this in my book. And I have to preface my book only because people wondered why I left Congress. I had one election. I didn't even have any opposition. I had a safe seat. I would win sixty percent of the vote. It was great. I could have stayed there. But there was something missing. It was the fulfillment that I was seeking that wasn't there. And it had to do with the fact that people were becoming more and more polarized, more and more divided. And I saw it happen in the presidential races. I saw it happen in the Supreme Court nomination process. I saw it happen on the floor. And as I look back at my notes you know, that I kept in my journal, I realized I was spending more time fighting my own party than I was trying to build relationships. And that's when it hit me, Steve, is that we at, at the core of our nation are not teaching the fundamentals, the basics of being able to build relationships through consensus. And, and, and it has to be done through civil discourse. And so I've I felt that, you know, as it, it began, it, it, it eroded. And when I saw what happened the other night in the in the uh, State of the Union address, it appalls me. I attended eight of those and never once did I see the, 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 the display of disrespect for the sanctity of the institution, first of all, of Congress, by some of the, 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 the outfit that one person was wearing and the, and the, and the heckling that was done uh, really bothered me. And, and, and you, you just can't have that. All it's going to do is set a bad precedent and spiral out of control. So we have to bring it back and we have to focus on civil discourse. We have to be able to get people to get out of their comfort zones in K through 12, teach them how to get it done. It's the only way we're going to be able to see, uh, you know, the leaders that 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 uh, that, that we want we, that we want to see. We have to be those leaders if we want to see those leaders. So. How do we actually do that? You know, we're, we're at a point now uh, in many ways where, you know, it's not like it used to be. It's not like even, yeah. you know, 10 years ago when, when you were in Congress. So thinking about, for example, at the, both at the K-12 level and where you work at now at the higher ed level, how do we actually do that? Well, we first of all can't say that, that, that well, we're going to teach politics by teaching policy. I'm a process driven person. I believe that understanding the process, which process means that you've got to be able to engage. You've got to understand the rules of the game, the, why we why we are seeking to get things done. And in order to do that, we have to teach people at an early age that this is a discipline. 
it's like anything else. And I talk about the, 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 the gentleman who wrote the, uh, the Couch to 5K book. It is discipline. Anything that you want to acquire and be good at in life, you've got to discipline yourself. It's the same thing with civil discourse. You've got to, you've got to challenge yourself to reach across you know, a, a diversity of thought and engage somebody in a conversation. And they may shut you down. They may do, you know, call you names, but it's okay. It's okay. It's getting you out there to do that. And then once you start developing the relationship, experience you know, the process of empathetic listening, utilize certain fundamental things such as humor to, to disarm somebody that's really ready and volatilely wanting to go after you. These, you start to understand that you can control. And the best part about it is not only building the relationship with the person, but you're building the self-confidence. When you look back at some of the greatest leaders of this nation, Teddy Roosevelt, the one thing that man was, was self-confident. He was knew who he was and he didn't need to prove himself to anybody with accolades or, 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 or anything else. He was strong in who he believed he was. And that's part of being good at civil discourse. Man, you can light a room up with the ability to communicate, uh, you know, it, 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 in person with people. And it all stems from learning the elements of civil discourse. So talk a little bit for us, you know, you're over at uh, uh, Southeastern, right? So talk a little bit for us what this looks like in your classroom. I know you were just in D.C. Uh, with uh, your students. What does this actually look like in your classroom? Well, you know, it's interesting because, first of all, I'm not a real professor. Uh, I, I, I admire you guys that are in ac academics and you're academicians. And I, I'm a lawyer by trade and a politician by practice. And I've been so blessed to be able to be in this environment with these young students who come in and, and they're afraid politically. They're not even sure why they're in their class other than they need an elective or maybe they've decided to go into political science. But what we do is we start we start off we, we, a little bit about American history. Uh, and 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 uh, understanding, you know, the formation of our country and the fact that we have self-government. And I asked them this. I said, do you trust politicians? And they said, no, why not? Well, because they're, they're corruptible. They are. OK, OK, let's 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 we'll give you that one. Politicians are corrupt. Do you believe that we are designed to have self-government that requires individual participation and citizens? Yes, we do do that. OK, well, if you're not going to get involved, then who's going to get involved? And if. You're not going to get involved. Then who do you trust to get involved? And they start saying, well, I don't know. I trust my mom. So do you trust yourself? Because if you trust yourself and you believe that self-government is necessary to not only sustain, but to thrive as a nation, then you have an obligation. If not you, then whom? And they start to understand that maybe they can make a difference. And then we learn about some of the most, you know, the average people have done incredible things in the political arena. Uh, and, and, and they start to see this and then we start to engage in debates. And Steve, one of the best things I love doing is having them debate a position that they that they're against because that forces them to see the other side. Um, we, you know, and then at the one time we'll do in class, we'll take a uh, we'll take a political uh, personality test and they'll realize that maybe they're liberal and their best friends conservative. And I split them up and all the conservatives sit on one side and all the liberals on the other. And I say, now, what are you going to do? Are you going to avoid your friend? Because they're politically different from you? No. All the more reason to strengthen that relationship. That's what it takes. And, and it, it, what you talked about earlier at the beginning of this program is the experiential opportunities. And I think that's crucial because there's only so much theory that, that, that they can absorb and, and they'll forget it anyway. But if they have the experiential opportunities, experiential opportunities, and if we have role models that show them how they ought to be. And if we have communities who encourage those role models and encourage and nurture these young leaders, it's because we need them. You know, the one thing that's appalled me is how we as a society have just absolutely denigrated our elected officials. Some of it deserve it, don't get me wrong, but we wanna see a better nation than let's as communities nurture, recognize young leaders to be involved. Let, let, let's, let's elevate them to the status of what we do with our high school athletics and our high school musicians and our high school uh, uh, arts uh, 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 champions. You know, let's do the same thing with the leaders that we want to see be in our communities because we need them. We, we've got to encourage them. We need good people in this process. So as someone who used to uh, sponsor student government, uh, I think I definitely second that idea of, you know, giving students an opportunity right, to actually engage in, in the practice of, of self-government. Um, you know, the research shows, you know, there are multiple proven practices, uh, you know, at least uh, six proven practices for emerging practices. Uh, and one of the most important ones is giving students the opportunity to engage in democratic practices, and particularly stuff like uh, self-government.
right, uh, and, and student government. And I think what you talk about there is a perfect example, right? That did you have that experience uh, when you were uh, in school? Yes, I did. In fact, that, that's one of the things that I also talk about in my book. I wasn't sure why I was ever interested in politics. I thought it was for ego driven purposes until I was entrusted with the public you know, trust and realized how significant as a steward of the public trust that this position was. And I was fortunate in my community and in, in when I grew up in Lakeland is that we had people that encouraged. We had, you know, you had the American Legion, you had the YMCA, you had local businesses. They were encouraging. We had a uh, 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 the Silver Garland Awards that had recognized certain categories, one of which was citizenship that I was recognized for. These things encouraged me to pursue that throughout not only my high school careers, but also in college. And I got involved in student government in college and then was fortunate enough to go to law school and have always been involved in the process. One thing I tell my students, and it's so true, is that, you know, they may, may not take an interest in politics, but politics will take an interest in them. Mm -hmm. and will take an interest in their wallet as well. So you might as well get involved because politics is going to permeate every societal occupation, sector, anything out there. Politics is going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can't necessarily disagree with that as well. Now, you, you talked uh, uh, really about the idea of individual participation. I think uh, in conjunction with that is the idea of civic responsibility. Yes. And you talked in, in your book a, a little bit. I remember a uh, passage where you talked about a gentleman you saw picking up trash. Yeah. And I, to me, that, that really connects back to this idea of civic responsibility. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. You know, it, there, there, when I was in Congress, there was a gentleman who uh, I, I was a re I am a Republican. He was a Democrat. He was a Democrat activist locally. And I would see him at the YMCA and locally around town. And he would he would just you know, not necessarily berate me, but he'd always differ with me on my opinions. You know, why are you doing this in Medicare? Why don't you do this? You know, you shouldn't be doing this and everything. And I after I left Congress, I was driving home one day and I saw him walking along the side of the road voluntarily picking up trash. Next day, same thing. And I was so impressed with this because despite our political differences, he had one thing in mind, and that was a better community. That to me is the epitome of civic engagement. That's where you're taking the personal responsibility to make your surroundings, your community better. And it's not running for office. And I wrote a letter to the editor about it, lauding him. And I put it in the book because I think it really explains why being involved is more than just running for office. It's taking, you know, an investment in your community by making it a better place. And, and you know, public supermarkets is a, is a prime example where, you know, it's an employee owned company. Well, consider that as citizens. Citizens in the United States are the United States. We essentially own the United States and it's we should take ownership of our citizenship. And it doesn't mean, again, running for office. It means making it a better environment helping those who can't help themselves. It's, it's, we look to government for everything when really the solution is us. I like that idea of, you know, the solution being us. It connects back, I think, to the idea of we the people, right? The yes. first three words of, of our U.S. Constitution. Uh, you know, and also, the, and I think, too, you talk a little bit about, about this as well, in, in that, yes, we are a nation of individuals, right? And individualism is, in many ways, at its core of, the, of who we are as a nation. But we are also a nation that is, is really tries to ensure we have a community focus as well, right? We, we cannot, that we, yes, we can certainly succeed as individuals, but, uh, you know, working together to improve our communities is a necessary component of civic life. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And I, you know, we, we have to assess our civic health. And I think once communities realize whether or not, and they can assess this, they can assess this with their graduation rates, they can assess this you know, with their crime rates, they can assess it with their economic uh, uh, level of affluence in, in their community, but more importantly, they can assess it through just who all is in active in their community. Is it the same old people? Or do we have outreach programs that encourage community involvement? Are we recognizing those that are stepping up and to do the right thing? Uh, it, it, and, and people want to be part of that community, Steve. They want to be part of something bigger than them that is more prosperous and, and, and gives them, and more importantly, their children a better future. So with that being said, uh, what is your ideal K-12 civic education program? How would you start? How would you take your students through? Really, and what? Did, so, what does it look like really from the beginning? And what are they leaving high school with, in your view? And I know I'm just throwing this at you for the first time, but it really just occurs to me as based on what you're talking about, an important question. 
Yeah, good question, though. But I would tell you, it, it's not going to be just in the schools. I think the curriculum is absolutely important. I think it's really important to learn fundamentals of American history. I think we have to teach both the black eyes and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the goodness of our country along the way and how our Constitution has allowed us to resolve these issues. When you look at the Dred Scott decision and just Chief Justice Roger Taney says that an African-American cannot and will not ever be a citizen of the United States, it's appalling to us today. It's unconscionable to us today. This is a Supreme Court decision. But yet Yet our Constitution has allowed us to resolve that through the amendatory process. And now that would, we wouldn't accept anything like that today. But our Constitution is still there. And we've got to be able to understand American history and that it has changed through the process of the Constitution. We also need to have community organizations adopt our schools, whether it be a civic club, whether it be a, a business operation, that they come in and they say, look, we what can we do to help you become more engaged in the community? How can we help you? City Council. Please invite your students to come sit through a meeting just to show what it's like. They're, it is as much theoretical as it is experiential. And if students start at an early age and understanding the respect that can be given to these elected officials, they start to crave it themselves and they understand that maybe this might be a path for them. Not so much as a career, but as an obligation in order to make a better nation. And then I would leave it in high school with, with, with a very simple you know, recognition of, of, of statesman leadership. Who all has been the statesman leaders in our in our high school this year? And 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 recognize them in your community. Recognize them because we want them to come back to this community and lead this community. They will by default be the generation that will be leading in not so long a period of time. Let us instill in them not only the understanding and appreciation for the laws in the community, but also for the opportunity to make it a better place than when they were there before. And, and, and if, we, if we as a community do that, if we do that through our education system in a cooperative fashion with our, our, uh, our private sector, our, our uh, chambers of commerce, I think we do a much better service and we reinstill some sense of civil discourse, which is so desperately needed. And I can't disagree with anything you say there, and I appreciate you laying out really what that vision actually looks like. Now, this idea of statesman leaders you, you, you brought up, can you talk a little bit about what you really mean by that term statesman leaders? Because it could mean different things to different people. Yeah. And first of all, it's gender neutral. Uh, it's gender neutral. It goes to all genders. So don't let that don't let that uh, dissuade you at all. Uh, statesman leaders are the ones that build consensus. What we're seeing today is divisive leadership that, that builds on pack mentality that says you're with us or against us and we got more with us than against us. So you better be with us. Otherwise, we're going to consider you to be against us. And that's not true. You know, you've got to be able to build consensus. You've got to be able to know that whomever may be your adversary today may need to be your advocate tomorrow. And you've got to reach across the aisle to build that relationship. And that's what a statesman leader does. A statesman leader builds relationships. They bring people together. It is an amazing thing to see once you understand where somebody's coming from, when they have the opportunity to be heard. You know, as a, as a lawyer and as a mediator, I was impressed more times than not how a case would resolve just because one of the litigants got a chance to say their piece and to be heard and to be understood. Did they get all that they wanted? No, but they got to be heard. And that, man, that, that is a powerful thing. Try it in your marriage relationship. It's the hardest thing for me to do, but my wife and I work at that, is try to understand where the other one's coming from. You know, I talk about this in my book, that 95% of our reactions are, are governed by our subconscious behavior. Imagine, the good thing is we can train that. We can train it so that our conscious behavior is what causes us to react. And when we react in a more conciliatory, a more relationship-building way, people gravitate to you. You start to show signs of genuine leadership. Why? because you're building consensus, you're bringing people together. You might not have the answers, but you can find the people who do. And they might not be the same political party, but that's okay, because you're all seeking the same, you know, you know, same result in a better nation. Uh, you know, I'm hearing you talk here, I'm picking up sound bites, like, you know, whoever's your adversary today could end up being your advocate tomorrow. And I, I think that's a very important point um, for uh, both students and just regular citizens uh, to take away from this. Uh, and you talked a lot and gave a lot of uh, really different ways in which we think about statesman leaders. But who would you actually put within that category historically? And who are your influences in thinking about statesman leaders? Yeah, good question. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I, I, I was I, I, I 
was young, very young uh, boy when when John Kennedy was uh, assassinated, and I was just fascinated with his rise. and 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 I would read a lot about him. Of course, profiles and courage I read a couple times, but I was I, I I think because he was such a young president, it gave me hope as a young man that there would be opportunities. Uh, and I always enjoyed reading about how he. Uh, distinguished himself, of course, in World War II. Yeah, he had he, he, he had some easy ways there. I mean, he came from an affluent family. Uh, he was very, uh, his history was was uh, instrumental. I mean, Harry Truman was another one. I mean, here was a here was a guy that became president by default. It wasn't, didn't even know we had a nuclear bomb and he's vice president of the United States. And what he does and what, and, and you look back at his history and how he was a consensus builder. He also failed as a, as a haberdasher. You know, he, he, he did a lot of things. Ronald Reagan was another one that just, it, it, when I was in college, I would listen. He would do these, uh, these, these radio spots about, that were just American driven, you know, not nationalism, but American driven. And, and that really instilled in me a sense of, you know, there's something here and, and I want to learn more about it. And it wasn't so much the party label as it was about the character of the person. And then, of course, when you look back and start looking at, you know, our history of presidents and, and, and Lincoln, who, who just was the best person we could have ever had at the time that it happened. But you, you look at somebody and I just, you know, t I talked about him earlier, but it was Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, here's a guy that was born wealthy, who, he's, who lost his mom and his wife in the same year. And he went away for two years to go ranch out in, in Montana and, you know, and, and lived a harsh life, but he built, it built his character. It built his confidence and brought, he came back and he was, he, he rooted out corruption in New York, you know? And, and in fact, the political bosses encouraged McKinley to take him on as his vice president because they didn't want him as governor anymore because he was doing such a good job rooting out corruption. And then by default, when McKinley is shot, he becomes president. And you see, you know, these are just amazing stories to me that give me confidence in the future and, and to show that we need to be doing more to, to build the, 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 the character of the person irrespective of the party. Let's talk about that word character, right? Because I think character plays a, does play a big role in civic education and in civic life, civic engagement, civic participation. What does that word character mean to you? You know, people say, well, it's, the old adage is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. As a politician, it's doing the right thing when everybody's looking. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's even more important because the political wins can can throw you off course. And one of the most important things that I endured this in my time, both in the legislature and Congress, is I stuck to what I believed was right. And, and I may have, you know, I, I, I might have been ostracized by my party, but it was, I knew what I was doing was the right thing. And that's what I think character is. It's doing the right thing when everybody's looking uh, because sometimes it's not what they want. And, and that's the one thing about being an elected official that it's very difficult is you, you, you are, uh, you, you are elected to do what you believe based on your experience is the right thing to do. You have to be parental. Uh, and, and unfortunately I think we've seen that, that, that we've, we've moved totally away from that. Uh, we moved totally away from that in so many areas, including higher education, where the, now we're saying the consumer's always right, the voter's always right, whatever the voter wants, we'll do. Well, that's not always right for the system. And so having the character to stand up to that, to understand that you are there for a fleeting period of time. What I enjoyed was telling people, you know, what was it like being a congressman? Well, Congress, being a congressman was an incredible honor, but it's what I did. It wasn't who I was. And as long as you can appreciate that, you'll have the character to do what you believe is the right thing to do. Well said, and I appreciate that. And, you know, before we jump into some questions, we have at least uh, one question uh, in the chat. Uh, Dennis, is there anything uh, relating to uh, student civic engagement or civil discourse you haven't touched on yet that you want to touch on? No, but I, I, I do want to say I, I would love to see us all come together. All the uh, more institutions come together and focus on this as the greater good is for what we need to be doing. Because I think we're doing our students a total disservice by not allowing you to utilize your curriculum to, to, to educate these students from K through 12. And, and, and I see it when they come into higher education, they don't have a clue. You know, they, they don't know that there's three branches of government. They don't know that people can actually get along. We've got to start them early. And I, and I hope that that's something that, you know, the state of Florida does and that, other states start to take, take take an initiative to do the same. Well, I will say that my friend and colleague and our former associate director, Dr. Terry Fine, 
um, is on here, and she's she's been many years teaching political science. I think she would agree with you about what students know yeah. when they come into her classroom. Um, so we do have a, a good question in the chat. Uh, question is: So as students learn to evaluate candidates as future voters, I like this question, and then actual voters. What would you advise them to look for in terms of judging if a candidate will be able to reach across the aisle if elected? Uh, one of the things I tell my students to do is to reach out to that candidate and see what type of response do you get. Do you get a solicitation letter back for a, a contribution? Do you get no response back? Uh, you know, I, I think a lot can be said by how this person responds, uh, the candidate responds to somebody that's inquiring. Now, it's harder on a national level, no question about it, because you're, it's, it's, but, but, but on, on local level, on state level, and even congressional level, I encourage my students to, to reach out and, ex and ask for advice from the candidates and see how they respond. And is it a form letter given back? And I, and I say, well, you know, that, that, that may tell you that they're not taking a sincere interest in those that are interested in them. And that might not be the right person that you need to, to support. But I, the, I, I go after the, the, the quality of the person first and then look at the issues behind them. Because I think if you can't have a relationship with somebody who's going to be making decisions about elected politics, then, then it doesn't matter what their politics are. You're never going to be able to change your mind or, or, or have a dialogue with them. But if you know that you can have a relationship with them, if you know they respond to you personally, if they'll listen to you, if they, 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 they offer you some advice or guidance, uh, then I think you can start worrying about whether they're going to be with you or not um, with, 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 uh, on a particular issue. Uh, because look, I, I, you know, I, the one thing that always killed me was the one issue people, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know, it's either this way or no way. And it's like, well, it's not because there's going to be another issue tomorrow. And, and, and then they'll say, well, apathy's come in. I, I, don't, I don't care for any of them. I'm not going to vote. Well, you've just empowered those who are mm -hmm. voting. And, and I don't think a lot of students get that. They would just rather just not vote, not participate, and think that it's going to be okay until the day comes when it's not and they have to be involved. And then they'll complain about it after. Absolutely. Um, so uh, follow-up question there uh, is, when communicating with officials, do you have a suggestion for preferred method of communication? Emails, in-person visits, scheduling meetings? What's your, what, what do you suggest as a former elected official? <laughs> First thing I would say is that it's not so much the, the, the medium you use, although I, I think uh, emails, it, it, I think it's how you go about doing it. And you have to understand, most of these people run for office because their egos are driving them to run for office. And if you can stroke that ego, if you can communicate with them and say, look, I've admired you. I've, I've, I've researched your background. I see where we have this thing in common. What advice would you give me? How would you recommend that I get involved? You know, I'd like to learn more about your campaign. Can I have an appointment to meet with you for, 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 for five minutes and, and learn more about you? I believe firmly that you have to stroke their ego. You got to, you, you know, you, because if it's if it's like, I wish you wouldn't vote this way or what's your stand on this? It's like, okay, here, they give it to a staffer. And and I would recommend that you that you stroke their ego. I mean, it's it's they're human and they crave that. And once they get that title, they crave it even more. And so uh, to me, uh, I've always enjoyed uh, building relationships with those that, that, that stroke my ego. Uh, and I've noticed that some of my students have done the same and it's led to them jobs. Oh, well, that, that, that's, that, I think that's in, in the current <laughs> environment. I think that's, that's a good thing too. It's, you know, how that's going to get me employed. Right. Yes. I, I, I think that's a good point. Um, other questions, uh, you can either unmute or put it in the chat for Congressman Ross. Do you feel like interest groups or money play a role in helping or hurting civil discourse? Oh my gosh, that is such, Kimberly, that is such a good question because the answer is yes, emphatically yes. And, you know, in addition to the 1.2, which I didn't have to raise, I mean, 1.2 is a lot of, 1.2 million dollars is a lot of money to raise in two years for a campaign. But in, re in, in relation to all the other campaigns out there, it's a small amount. But in addition to do that, I had a, I'd have to raise close to $450,000 for the party in order to maintain my committee assignments, uh, which, you know, forces you to have to travel the country and try to find resources. And the money becomes a big issue in it. And, 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 and in order to get some of these funders, you know, they're extreme. Some of them are extreme. They want to know what your position is on immigration. Will you close the border? Will you do, you know, this? Will you? And 
And you got to be careful. One of the things I always teach my students, and I've learned the hard way, is you never say never in the political arena. You can't box yourself into that. And you've got to be careful about who's giving you money. And, and you, and you got to be ready to return it if it's not from the right source that subscribes to your ideology. And yes, I think that money has, it, it, um, money has become a way of driving a greater wedge between us and er uh, eroding civil discourse. In other words, I will, I, I'll send you an email, uh, you know, saying, do you agree that we should, you know, uh, eliminate all the illegal aliens, especially those that are murdering our, our women and children, then by golly, yeah, but, so send me a dollar, send me $5, then I know you're a qualified contributor. So it's being used, anti-civil discourse is being used mm -hmm. to raise a lot of money. Um, and I, and, but, but what's worse about this, Kimberly, is that we're seeing super PACs which, you know, the Citizens United, when it first came out, it was like, OK, this is good. No, it's not good because it's allowing these super PACs to now go out and, and, and raise all kind of dark money, meaning you don't have to tell where it's coming from and be involved in issue advocacy or candidate advocacy to the exclusion of a candidate who can't raise the kind of money to do it. And, and candidates that want to stay in office find themselves having to placate their base or placate their, their their leadership and and it takes away from your individual thought it takes away from your individual action so yes i think money has done a great disservice to being able to foster and otherwise build a civil discourse practice amongst us so how do you fix that well you know we've we've tried many times we've uh, the supreme court right now uh is probably the only way we're going to get it done it won't happen in congress in my opinion because we've seen the uh <laughs> I could not, this is what was interesting. I could not um, accept a cup of coffee from you as a member of Congress uh, if you had a federal lobbyist or if you gave me anything of value at over $25. However, I could take you to dinner at the restaurant of your choice, wherever you wanted to go and pay for it. I would pay for it. And then you would give my campaign a $5,000 check. Now, uh, the, the absurdity of that is that, well, you're, you're not you're not buying my influence. You're 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 helping my campaign and I'm paying for the meeting. So therefore, it's all legal and above board. Transparency is very important. We have to be able to have more reporting of where these sources of funds are coming from and be able to have people understand that the sources might be the problem if we can expose where they're coming from. I, I don't know if we can get there. I don't see what I mean by that. I don't see Congress addressing campaign reform to create greater transparency so that the average voter would understand where the money's coming from. I see what happening is that more and more super PACs are being created. I followed this in the legislature in Florida. I, you know, you, you've got legislators leaving, uh, retiring with $2 million in a leadership pack. What are they going to do with it? They're going to become kingmakers since they can't be king anymore. You know, they can, they, they can perpetuate themselves as long as they want. I don't have a super PAC, by the way. I don't have any PACs. I don't have any. I got rid of all my campaign funds when I got out. But this is something that, that, that makes it difficult for the average person to want to be involved when they're up against these, th these, these PACs that have been out there for a while and that decide that they're the ones that are going to, you know, develop the candidate uh, more so than the candidate developing the campaign. I, I honestly, I, it, Congress has to change it. But I don't see the, the, them having the political fortitude to do. I mean, they can't even they, we, we can't keep a speaker for very long. I don't, I don't see Congress being able to do any campaign finance reform. I appreciate how you sort of laid that out there. And it, it raises a question for me that I appreciate your, your, your thoughts on here is, you know, I think one of the things that, that keeps people away from being involved in politics and, and running for office is this idea that it, it's basically once you're in office, you're campaigning for your next election. You are immediately, including fundraising. I mean, so you would say there's some truth to that. Oh, there's absolutely truth to that. I mean, if, and you never you never close out your campaign account in Congress. You do in, in the legislature. In Florida legislature, you have to close it out after the election uh, and disperse the funds. But in Congress, you're just perpetually, you know, campaigning for office. And it never stops. Uh, is that good or bad? You know, I, it, it's, it's what you do as the individual. If you let it run you, then, then it may be bad. But if you, you know... I didn't, I, I, I left after eight years. I was going to try to do 10, but I realized that, that eight years was enough for me. 
we need to set examples of, of you know, citizen leadership and then go back and do what you were doing and help create the next level of, of, of leaders to come forward. And, and maybe that's what we need to instill. I don't know. The average congressional uh, term or in Congress, I, I think, is just under eight years. Um, but it, it, two years is you're constantly running, Steve. And I think that's a drawback, certainly. Right. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah. Um, it, it is. And, and getting good people to run in the process, that's the thing that kills me. When we saw the the the, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, when I was in Congress and, and uh, Brett Kavanaugh was up for consideration uh, to the Supreme Court, and what happened there, not only to him, but to some of the witnesses against him, the character assassinations, the deplorable comments, the, the disastrous uh, the allegations, why would anybody want to be involved? Why would anybody want their children or their grandchildren involved in this process? And, and that's where I think we've got to, as a society, let me tell you something. You know, I know my, who my super voters are. They're the four for four. They're every four years they vote in all four elections and they make up about 25% of the registered voters. And I know if I can continue to get them, I'll continue to be elected. If those super voters go to 50% or 35%, then my message has to change. I have to dilute my message and make it a more broad so it's not so extreme. And suddenly that changes the way we govern as well because it's gonna change the way we get elected. So having more people vote in an election would definitely serve to, to, to change the message and change the way those who get elected govern, because now you don't cater to that extreme as much as you now have to cater to the, to the, to the middle moderate voters out there as well. I'm thinking of what, you, what you're really talking about here and what we've been talking about throughout uh, the evening, but something that you haven't necessarily touched on is social media. Yeah. Do you think social media has played a role in where we are in civil discourse. And how would you try to address some of that? Well, it has, there's no question it has. And, and it's probably done more harm than good. I looked at it as a candidate, as a great way to target. I knew who was on Pandora. We knew, you know, you could cross uh, reference somebody's voter registration data with their, uh, their phone data, with their certain marketing data. I mean, there's so much data collection going on out there today that it's just that you, you can you can cross reference all this stuff and target your campaign. So I know who to target, when to target them. And, 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 I, and, and the base of this was always a registered voter. So if, if they were active in social media, but weren't a registered voter, I didn't care about that. But as long as I know they're a registered voter and then I layer on top of that all this other data and I find out what their through analytics, what their preferences are, then I can target them. That helps me get elected. That's the science of getting elected. Unfortunately, social media has done more to create the, the, the division that we have in our nation. And, and I think it's created an opportunity where people hide behind their devices and keep, uh, you know, Keep, keep from wanting to develop relationships and finding solace in a, in a, in a cyber room where everybody that they, that, that they believe is in there agrees with them. That's just not healthy. And, and interpersonal relationships, there's just no substitute for that. You know, COVID showed that to us and COVID, you know, it, we're still recovering from, from the, from the social, you know, um, problems that we had for not being able to get, interact uh, with, with people. But it, uh, Social media has had a big effect, especially, and I teach this to my students, you know, we can't regulate a foreign nation uh, using social media to influence our elections. We just can't. So you, you, you kind of got to start thinking on your own and doing your own independence, you know, research. And yeah, it takes some time, but, you know, the benefits are, are you, you all of a sudden develop your own leadership qualities in doing so. And I think that uh, points us to the the important uh, fact that we need to have do a better job, I think, with media literacy at the K-12 level and what that yes. actually means and what that looks like. Um, so we are running short on time. Are there any other questions for Congressman Ross? Silence is affirmation. That's how I get my video games. All right. Well, Congressman Ross, is there anything that you want to close with? No, I, I you know, again, my passion has been for, for what I see to be the future. 
And, and I was blessed to be able to have good mentors at almost every level uh, and stage in my life, whether it was through, through elementary school, high school, college, career, and otherwise. We need to be encouraging these people to continue to be mentors, to have communities come together and build the leaders that we want to see, because that's the only way we're going to be able to see a more perfect union. And I'm hopeful that through your work and all of you all that are out there, especially during this week of Civics Week, that we understand that we're all in this together. And yes, we're making progress progress, but it's one student at a time. And I appreciate that. Uh, and but the question did pop up that I would really interested in your thoughts. And um, what would you say to a jaded public? I love that phrase about party being put before country. You know, it's not the first time, which is why we need people who are self-confident and know that the greater good is exactly what is their main purpose. It's not self-interest, uh, it's self-government. And I, all we have to do is go back to the we the people, the preamble to the constitution to find the greater good. And that's our common ground. That is not a party driven uh, uh, the, the document. That is, 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 a, is a document that, that allows us to retreat, to confirm where we should be, where we should be going and how we should be getting there. Um, you know, I, I was ostracized by my party many times. Uh, I, I, when I was elected to Congress, my first term, I was voted, I, Numbers USA had me one of the top five conservatives. When I left eight years later, I was 156. I didn't change. The party changed around me. And, and, and I, I, you know, I'm glad I didn't change. Well, on that note, I want to thank you so much for being here on behalf of the Institute and for Civic Learning Week. Uh, I found the conversation very, very engaging and interesting, and I hope others uh, did as well. Um, and we would certainly like to share this with folks if, if you're comfortable with that. Um, and uh, so if anyone has any sort of um, uh, interest in contacting us, if they want a cop copy of um, the Congressman's uh, book, you can go ahead and uh, contact uh, me here at the emails you see uh, on uh, the screen. Uh, you see my email, uh, Stephen with a PH dot Maseda, M-A-S-Y-A-D-A -A at UCF.edu, and more than happy to send you a copy uh, uh, of the book. Um, so, uh, Congressman Ross, thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, being here for what we think is a very important conversation. Thank you again, and have a wonderful evening and a great Civics Learning Week. Thanks to you thank both. You it was good. Thank you all. Great way bye -bye. to start the week. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. bye.